once again, welcome to Whispering Hope. This is Tuesday morning, and we're here to look into God's Word, to fellowship with each other, because as we study the Word of God, we always find it to be a sweet fellowship with those who are on Whispering Hope, and amongst ourselves. And so I'm delighted to welcome you once again to this another day of activities, a day of revelation, a day of in-depth study here on Whispering Hope. As usual, we have with us, to help us to understand the lesson for today, two very notable elders and good friends of mine, Elder Jacqueline Gordon and Elder Andy David. Now, Elder Gordon was absent last week. As a matter of fact, uh, we were not here last week. There were different persons filling in. You know, Whispering Hope is full of resources. So when one or two or three, in this case, can't make it, there are others who can do so. So we're glad that those who filled in last week did so. And indeed, we're happy to be back with you this week on this Tuesday morning. So Elder Jacqueline Gordon, welcome once again. You were away on assignment. You may want to fill us in on that one, perhaps not. But anyway, let's greet the folks this morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here again. And, you know, whispering hope, you know, it brings God's word so alive and real. So we are thankful to be here with you. We are thankful to be a part of the program. And we pray that God's Holy Spirit will just move upon us in a mighty way way today again welcome amen amen thank you so much elder gordon elder david how are you doing so far for the week how has the lord been treating you let's greet the folks this morning hey good morning everyone happy to be here well the lord has been certainly good to me happy to be back after a brief hiatus and i trust that the lord will continue to bless us as he always does i'd like to say welcome to those who are on the platform this morning Amen. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, we're going to go straight into uh, taking care of business. And so we're going to start with a word of prayer, as we always do. And then we're going to have the memory text for this week. So I'm going to ask Elder David to give us our prayer this morning, that the Lord will guide us in our discussion. And then Elder Gordon is going to read for us our memory text, and we proceed from there. Elder David, go right ahead. And so loving, Lord, what a wonderful privilege it is that we could come again to study your word. And dear God, as we continue into this brand new quarter, we ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide us, lead as you would have led in the past. As we deliberate today, may we all be blessed as we delve into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And amen. Our memory text is taken from Ephesians chapter 1, reading verse 3. And it reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Amen. And so I want to thank Elder David for the prayer and for Elder Gordon for reading for us a memory text. The lesson this week, this is the second lesson in this brand new quarter. Like I said, we missed the first week's lesson discussion in the quarter, but we're here for the second lesson and we're going to go through God's grand Christ-centered plan. It can be a tongue twister for some of you. God's grand Christ-centered plan. And so, Elder Gordon, you would have read for us our memory text from Ephesians 1 and verse 3. And we are studying for this whole quarter. Imagine that we, we get to study for an entire three-month period, not gospel, sorry, one particular book of the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. Can you imagine that, folks out in Whispering Hope land, I heard someone referred it to, <laughs> that we're studying an entire book for three months. That's got to be in-depth. So, Elder Gordon, you would have read the memory text taken from none other than Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And as usual, just give to those who are viewing, those who are listening, your insights in terms of the memory text and how it ties into the lesson study for this week. Paul here is acknowledging the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So he starts by saying, Blessed be the God, our Father. Where we know everything is wrapped up in Jesus. His death, his resurrection, ascension, and intercession. However, he starts by giving the prelude to God himself. Because God is also wrapped up in the plan of salvation. And having 
executed the plan of salvation, the amount of blessing that God has in store for us. I dare say that Paul is not just leaving it to Christ, though we know it is wrapped up in Christ. Paul is giving attributes to God himself. Because sometimes when we think about the plan of salvation, think about Jesus alone. But I think based on what we're going to study here, we are going to see a unification of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Sometimes when we think about God, we think about a God who is judgmental, ready to wipe us out, not having no grace. But here again, we have seen it in the Old Testament, still seeing it here paul is alluding to the fact that god is a god of love god is a god of grace because he has given unto us his son to execute the plan of salvation amen amen and we're going to look further into that plan of salvation because you know in life we always need to plan even when we are planning our own lives our families a, a career path or what you're going to plan to do for the word of god are we going to spread the gospel? There must be a plan, but there must not just be a plan only. There must be an execution of the plan. And so we're looking at God's grand Christ-centered plan. Elder David, anything you want to add on that memory text? I think Elder God was spot on just to say that Paul began his letter to the Ephesians by sounding a note of praise to God. And we got the reason in the latter part of the text, why he was praising God. He said, because he had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And I guess as we proceed, we're going to unravel what that spiritual blessing or those spiritual blessings are. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Indeed, he has blessed us in heavenly realms. So Tuesday's lesson is entitled, God's Grand Christ-Centered Plan. We get this week, elders, the title of Today's lesson is the same as for the week. And so it, I guess it's a microcosm of the entire week uh, study, or maybe it's the fulcrum or the center part of what we're studying for this week. So God's grand Christ-centered plan, same title for the week as it is for today. And so we want to just look at what is this grand Christ-centered plan? When we think about Elder David, I'm coming to you, when we, when, when we look at the word Christ-centered plan, it almost speaks for itself, Christ-centered plan. But what does it mean to be Christ-centered? I mean, people may have an understanding, but what does it actually mean to be Christ-centered? Give us a picture of what, the, what does that look like. Okay, the plan we are talking about here is the plan of salvation. And the salvation could only have come through Jesus Christ. We all know that because of sin, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And before the foundation of the world, the plan of salvation was put in place. And central to that plan was the fact that Jesus was going to come and shed his blood. All right. So the Bible tells us that salvation comes only through Jesus. So the plan is the plan of salvation. And we can only gain salvation through Jesus. So the plan, therefore, is centered in Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection to offer us salvation. Okay, so everything surrounds and revolves and rotates around Christ. He is the center of it all. He is the main focus. He is the only focus. He is the only purpose of the plan. And he's the one who's going to fulfill that plan and execute that plan. So now, Elder Gordon, read for us in Ephesians. You know, I must pause and say here that I just love when we have a, a study on a particular book of the Bible. That's just me. Perhaps others like thematic studies for the for the quarter uh we're studying a particular theme and it comes from here there and everywhere within the bible i like when you're just studying one book for me i find it a little bit more easier for me to study that way but you know that's just me others may have different opinions elder gordon could you read for us ephesians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 or verses 9 to 10 and then i'm going to ask you a question based on that particular passage of scripture ephesians 1 verses 9 and 10 Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10, reading from the King James Version. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. All right. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon. 
So then what is God's plan for the fullness of time? It says in here, the fullness of time. And how extensive is its reach? I'm basically asking two questions. God's plan for the fullness of time and how extensive or how far reaching does it go? Well, I think Elder David touched on it earlier. The plan is centered, surrounded, encompassed. The catalyst of God's plan is Jesus Christ. Why Jesus Christ? Because of sin. We know Adam and Eve, our first parents, that they disobeyed God and sin entered all of us. So the plan is God wants to work with us to his good pleasure. And all that happens through the sacrifice, before we say sacrifice, to the obedience. It was Jesus who, in obedience to God's will, came to pay the price for us. And oftentimes we talk about just when he died on Calvary's cross. But when we look at Jesus' ministry, especially the last three and a half years, Jesus suffered. Jesus was mocked. Jesus was pat upon. Jesus was even betrayed by those who were in his inner circle. And finally, the real plan on that cross, we know there's a song that says that he could have called 10,000 angels. Even, and we have to remember this, even while Jesus was obedient to God, and when God turned his back upon his son because of our sins that were placed upon him, God too was involved in the plan. We wanted the plan to be executed. And Jesus went all the way. He endured. And I think that is something that we must learn too from this book of Ephesians, where Paul is encouraging the believers to endure. He was encouraging them to grow a little higher in the Lord. And so that level of endurance that Jesus bore for us. And in the end, when he could have said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Do we see the plan coming out here? He says he wished that none perish, but all should be saved. And so, yes, the plan was executed through Jesus Christ. He died, he resurrected. In heaven, he ascended and interceded for us. And so, yes, we see God here wishing for us to unravel this mystery. What's the mystery that is wrapped? in Jesus, and daily we would see it unfold in the fullness of time. Excellent. Thank you, Elder Gordon. Elder David, the text says in verse 10, let me just read it again from the King James Version. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. And it goes on, Paul says, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Elder David, the question for you is, what is the final, ultimate end of the plan? What is the ultimate achievement that God is trying to do here? It's to unify all people from all ages. All right? And you asked earlier about the extent and how far reaching. Now, God's plan is to, through the death of Jesus Christ, to unify the entire world, to bring man back to himself. It is to restore what was lost in Eden. That is that relationship that God had with man in Eden. Now, God wants to restore that relationship with the entire universe. And that is how far reaching it is. All men of all time who have ever lived, God wants to bring unity. And that is why he made provision. He gave the opportunity the Bible spoke early, I think, about predestination. Before the foundation of the world, God created the opportunity for all of us to come to unity in Christ when once we would have accepted his death, his sacrifice as atonement for our sins. Excellent. So we're looking at unity and universal unity because we often tend to think of ourselves or maybe selfishly or unknowingly as just, you know, we are the only people in God's eye. We're the only of God's creation. We're the only intelligent beings that God would have made. The Bible makes references to the sons of men coming before Christ and, and the angel Lucifer or the devil coming before them as well. And theologians' understanding is that those persons represent representatives of other worlds. 
So when we talk about unity, yes, of course, the end of the plan is unity amongst us here on this earth, but the Bible speaks about in heaven and on earth. And so we're talking about here not just unity between earth and heaven only, but unity throughout all of God's creation. Because there was once upon a time when there was total balance, total balance within the whole creation of God. But that balance was thrown out. It came off balance because sin entered in heaven, first of all, with Lucifer, and then on earth. And so here is it that God is vindicating himself and he's balancing out everything. And he's going to bring perfect unity, perfect harmony to all of us once again here on this earth. Thank you once again, elders, for your input on that one. So we're looking at the book of Ephesians for this quarter. And we're looking basically for this week in terms of what we need to study. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, and Ephesians 2, verse 6, and Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. So when we get to study a book like Ephesians, it's always interesting to understand the context in which it was being written. But last week's lesson would have dealt with that in terms of the framing of Ephesians and who's the, who the author was and so on. But as we proceed in today's study specifically about God's grand Christ-centered plan, the question I want to ask you, coming back to you, Elder Gordon, is that here is it that Paul is writing to the Ephesians. And I believe studying last week, you would have recognized the context in which Paul was writing from or where he was writing from. And it made reference to the book of Acts as well, in terms of certain things that were hinging on the study of Ephesians. Let me ask you, Elder God, how was the attitude, the behavior, the Christian practices, the condition, what was the spiritual condition of those in the church in Ephesus and, and of course, surrounding areas? Because the letter was written to Ephesians, but it was also circulated. What was the status and why would you think Paul would be addressing them in this manner in terms of writing the epistle to the Ephesians? Yes, well, Paul himself was imprisoned at the time and recognizing what was happening, Ephesus was the center of traction, industrialization, and what was worst was that it was a city of idol worship. And so it was, you can understand that being surrounded, being immersed with that level of idolatry, Diane, I mean, these statues that were worshipped, and Paul's mission, we must remember that Paul was zealous for the kingdom of God. His zealousness even pervaded even in prison. He was there in prison. It could not have been a luxury moment. But yet still, because he understood the far-reaching effect of the gospel, that even as we studied about the whole plan of unification because the devil he's the one that brings about divisiveness he's the one that brings about separation and so paul was there encouraging them to hold on in god paul was there encouraging them and reminding them of who god is yes it may seem mysterious now but hey the plan is for god to ultimately gather all of us and one day reign with him so yes they were succumbed they were surrounded they were perplexed with idol worship it was what it was the scenery at the time it was one was that was boosting the economy however paul never lost hope and i think the same thing can be said of us today we are surrounded we are immersed with all forms idolatry and all sort of rights that are coming on stream and even the whole context of the institution that will seek to change times and laws and make it hard and difficult for the people of God to stand firm for God. But just as Paul encouraged them back then, in spite of what was happening around us, he is letting us encouraging us today because we are no different to them. We are surrounded and perplexed by so many evil but the word has come to us to encourage us to hold on to keep our eyes upon jesus to immerse ourselves with the vision i think the last quarter was so powerful when we understand the three angels message was moving swiftly so that men and women can be snatched out of darkness into the marvelous light of god so although idolatry was there it is still here and the letter is still applicable to all of us 
Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Elder Gordon, for that. Elder David, we're still talking about the great, grand, Christ-centered plan. And so Paul is writing to the Ephesians, and he's writing and he's making certain statements and encouraging them to understand that, hey, look, you can't lose with Christ. That, that's basically the essence of it. And so here is it that we find that in Ephesians, Paul is writing and he's saying that God died, Jesus died, he was resurrected, he ascended into heaven, and he's exalted in heaven. He found the church and he unified the church. When Christ came on earth, he established the church. And we have the disciples that are continuing in this vein, in casting out demons, in spreading the gospel, in raising up congregations. When we look at the church today, Elder David, I'm coming home a little bit more toward modern times now. When we look at the church today, or God's church today, <laughs> it may be a tough question, but still make a stab at it. How unified are we? And does uniformity mean unity, if you understand the question? Does uniformity mean unity? And what's the status of the unity of Christ, the body of Christ today? If I can just go back a little bit on the question that you asked first, and then I'll come back and answer about what was happening. We know that Paul in Acts, when he came on the scene, he preached. And to the point where the people in Ephesians, Elder Gordon re made reference to the fact that they worshipped idol, they worshipped Diana, they the goddess, and so on. And people started to, their businesses, their businesses were affected because they used to make these idols and so on that people worship. So Christianity was the in thing to the point where it was people kicking out the idols and so on. And we know what happened because the people went and they tried to kick Paul out and so on because he was affecting their commerce. Now, at this time, Paul is now, at the time he's writing, is now in prison. And some years would have passed between what happened then and presently when Paul is writing. And so because of that, people started to lose heart. Paul is now in prison, the one who came and preached and so on. They were falling back. There was this unity there too among the Gentiles and the Jews and so on. So there was need for unity there also, different races. And so Paul found it necessary to write and to encourage them that, hey, uh, this thing, the same gospel that was preached, the same Jesus that was preached, this thing is still relevant. This thing that you're involved in is not anything small. Christ is still coming. He is still working towards unifying the entire universe. That is what you are a part of. Don't lose heart. And we today, the message as his elder Gordon mentioned, it's relevant to us because today, when you look at what is happening in the world, materialism and all of that, sometimes we tend to forget that Christ is still coming. With regards to unity, there is a difference between unity and uniformity. We are all different individuals. We are all going to do things differently. It doesn't mean that there isn't one way of doing things. We're going to be doing the same thing in different ways to achieve the same end. Regarding unity, the unity that we ought to have is that we all ought to come together. We all ought to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior. And we all ought to be spreading the gospel, working towards this final grand occasion, this grand unity that is going to happen when Jesus comes. But that is the unity that ought to happen. Whether or not we are where we, we are supposed to be today regarding that unity, I think it's an individual thing. When each of us are uh, 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 in a relationship with Jesus Christ, and then collectively, that unity is going to be seen, is going to be evident. No, unity does not mean uniformity. We can be united and not be in uniformity. All right, thank you. So therefore, when we see, for example, a uniform body wearing all their lovely uniforms and outfit, and they're looking good, they're maybe walking together, marching together perhaps, and so on. That's uniformity. Uh, when we see the, the formation of church services and the litany, or liturgy of the church service, and we see certain things going in a uniform manner in this local congregation here, and this one over there, and this one across the street, uh, that's uh, uniformity. But if I'm understanding you correctly, Elder David, you're saying that unity 
is a different thing in that you need to be unified in Christ and what he stands for, what he te teaches. And therefore, it's good to have uniformity, could be an identifying mark, but the crux of the matter is unity in Christ. And then that unity in Christ should bring all of us together. But I want to ask a, a practical question to you, Elder Gordon. Our time is going, but how do we, we've been talking about unity, the great Christ-centered plan of God is to unify all of us to Christ Jesus. How do we, in a very practical sense, Elder Gordon, in today's world, how do we acquire that unity? I mean, you could give the easy answer, uh, according to me, the easy answer is we can do it through Christ, for stop. But let's look at some practical ways. How do we go about unifying with the church or with our neighbors, with our fellow men? How do we do that? Uh, I personally believe that first we must understand God's mission that he has given to the church. I think Paul puts it nicely in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he speaks about the body of Christ. When he speaks about the fact that we all may have diverse gifts, we all, not may, will have. The God, God is going to bless his church with varied gifts. But the gifts come together for the unification, for the edification of the church and so when we understand the mission and it is no wonder when we look around in organizations and so on they all have a mission statement what's the purpose of that so that every each and every employee when they enter the workspace they would understand why am i here what purpose do I fulfill in this organization and if we can understand the mission of our workspace it is the same thing with God. When God created the world in Genesis, what did he say? Did he do it unilaterally? No. He said, let us make man. Let us do this. Let us do that. As he began to execute the plan of salvation, even in Jesus, Jesus oftentimes would go far apart and just spend time with his father because he know when he's united with god the mission though impossible he can go through it and i think the same thing the thread the common thread that should unify all of us as christian is jesus christ and the mission to which we were called we must understand that we are called to live together to unify and to spread so it is horizontal it is vertical we have to go out and bring in and when we go out do we select those to whom we carry this message do we say listen i don't want to go to this religion i don't want to go to this group of people no god wants us to go out spread this everlasting gospel because at the end of the day when jesus died he died for each and every one i think it was in first peter chapter 3 where he says that he's not slack concerning his promise but what his desire is that all men should come to repentance and if Je this is jesus's mission if jesus can die and even that thief on the cross could have gained salvation on the cross though he deserved death who are we who are we to be separated from one another i think when separation comes that's the plan of the devil but when unification comes is when we understand that we have to come together to execute and bring a finality to the plan of salvation so as elder david say when that great getting up morning comes when Jesus comes, we all will be resurrected to meet him and live with him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. So unification is important because it is a unification that God used to create and to recreate all of us. Amen. Amen. And the final question today to Elder David. Thank you so much, Elder Gordon, for your in-depth response to that. Elder David, when you consider the fact that you have experienced redemption through the blood of Christ because Paul speaks about it a lot in Ephesians. We have experienced redemption through the blood of Christ Jesus. When you consider that, Elder David, that you personally or anyone else, you want to put it in the context of others, 
when you recognize that your redemption is part of, of a, a great, grand, that great, grand, Christ-centered plan of salvation, when you think about it, that it's a sweeping movement that was, is going to unify or unite all of us. How does that make you feel, Elder David, in terms of knowing that God is redeeming all that accept him, all that embrace him, and it's a part of the great plan that he has for all of us? Now, as you've said, it is indeed a great, grand, and sweeping plan. Not only that, we read earlier that it was crafted in heavenly places. This was a plan that was crafted, I would say, in a divine council. And to think that I am a part of that, it gives me a certain sense of worth, a certain sense of importance, that Christ would want to include me in this. Now, I should want to run and shout this to everyone on the mountaintop so that they can understand that, look, you too, a part of this. You two are so important that God included you in this so that they can all come so that we can eventually be a part of that great unity of the universe that will take place. I encourage us all, those of us who are listening, those of us who are on the platform, to consider the vastness, the greatness of this plan and that God taught it best to include you, to include us all. And the least we can do is to live for him and to tell someone else about it. Excellent. And with that, we'll take that as your closing thoughts. Elder Gordon, I come to you for your takeaway for today, today's study. What's your takeaway for today in brief, in summary? Basically, I'm going to join with Elder David. The same verses we read, 9 and 10, that God purpose within his heart. God was intentional in the plan of salvation and as it says in verse 10 that we all can be gathered together in the fullness of time so yes i feel i am blessed to think that though wretched i am a sinner out there in the miry clay and yet still god could have stout his hand and put me as a part of the plan of salvation. And I think early on it was said, it was predestined. God already said, though Satan messed up these people, I am going to do everything in my power to reconcile them back to me. So that spirit of reconciliation and unity, I am blessed. And I know all of us who are listening should feel special knowing that God purpose in his heart to have you on his mind when he planned, when he created that plan of salvation. Excellent. Amen. We want to certainly thank Elder Gordon and Elder David once again for their commitment towards studying with us every single Tuesday morning. We also thank you, our viewers, for continuing to be a part of Whispering Open, spreading the good news of salvation. God has a plan. That plan has been effected. And that plan includes every and anyone. The most known text, or the best known text in the Bible, John 3, 16, is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. On one hand, you have perishing, and on the other hand, you have everlasting life. And it says, whoever, anyone, your friend, your neighbor, your co-worker, you who are watching, who are, haven't given your heart to the Lord, God can save you because he has already made provision for it. It's for you to accept. We encourage you to continue to study with us, continue to pray, continue to be steadfast in God's work. Until next time, have a wonderful day. May God bless you.